Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Brian Baptist Church on this, our crispy, toasty Sunday night service. Welcome to the heat wave that never seems to end. I'm so glad for air conditioning. And I'm, I'm putting the offer out again. I still have, at the end of service, I still have mini cones and otter pups. So I still have a supply. So we'll see what we can do to eradicate that right after service down in the fellowship hall. So glad that you're here. We're going to grab a songbook. We're going to stand together. Brother Carl is going to lead us in a song right now. Okay, number 264. 264 is able to deliver it. for what our God is able to do. He is able to help you. He is able to strengthen you. And uh, whatever, the, whatever the issue is, whatever the problem is, don't ever think that God's just up there in heaven and you've got the proverbial celestial busy signal. God is paying attention. And uh, he's just waiting for you to talk to him. And it's amazing what God will do if you do. Let's have a word of prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being able to fellowship together. I thank you for this church family. I thank you for the excitement of being able to team up and work hard to do something that's big for us. And so we look ahead to this fair coming in a couple of weeks, and uh, we certainly do pray that uh, you would help us as we continue to prepare for this. Uh, we ask, Lord, every camper, every worker going to camp tomorrow, uh, that you'd prepare us, help us as we pack our bags as well. Please meet with us tonight in this service. Please speak to us through your word and hear us as we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So you may be seated, but keep that songbook handy. Number 94. Oh, I want to see him. Amen. Number 94.
checking here again bulletin of the month second sunday of the month is there anybody you do not have the bulletin of the month just checking checking uh, looking around right here and it looks like everybody has that so just make mention of a few things please be in prayer for a group of us we're heading off to camp we are loading uh the shuttle and the van at six in the morning with the goal of departing at six thirty. Uh, so make sure if you have campers here, make sure your camper is fully packed. Make sure that your camper has a sack lunch. Um, I haven't had a chance to review the forms. I sure hope you signed everything. And I don't have to chase you down at sunset tonight. I'm really hoping uh, that I don't have to do that. Just be in prayer. Uh, Brother Andrew, Miss Megan, uh, Mrs. Watkins, and myself, we are accompanying the children to camp. And uh, as I've told some of you, we have a contingent uh, from Florence Baptist Church in Montana that is also going to be at camp. We're kind of excited about that, get to see them again, and uh, just be in prayer for each camper. Uh, we want them to have a good time. We don't want them to break any bones, but, uh, but we do want them to be moved by the Lord. We know we want something to happen. God changed my life as a teenager, and I was, in a, I was in a very small country church. We had no functioning youth group. 
and we didn't, there wasn't really anything going on in the church. You think, well, that guy's going to turn out for God. Uh, but I had a good pastor who loved the Lord, and I had the Holy Spirit of God. It's amazing what the Holy Spirit of God can do when it grabs hold of a person. And so I praise the Lord for that. Now, making mention, I have there many cones, otter pops following the evening service Sunday, July 7th, backed by popular demand after Sunday, July 14th. Many cones and otter pops downstairs as well. And then uh, make mention of this again, Brother Craig, thank you for speaking on Wednesday. He will be speaking Wednesday. Men, we have a breakfast. Men's breakfast Saturday at 8.30 in the morning. And so men, just getting you ready for that. And I want to thank all of you who came for the Family Fun Fair meeting this afternoon. We really did get uh, a lot of things accomplished, a lot of things ironed out. We are, we are on the move now. And I'm very, very excited about that. Uh, I just need somebody to maybe actually order and reserve the porta potty. Does somebody want to actually do that one? I'm looking around here and everybody's going, what? Do I really have to? Okay, Paul, can you reserve that? Okay, we will reserve that for drop off on Saturday, pick up on Monday, because we don't want to drop it off on Sunday. Because if we do, they'll they'll have the truck will have to back over registration tables and everything to get it into its proper location. So anyway, but that would be great, Paul. I'll give you that to do, and that's just one of those little things coming again. Family fun fair is going to be on the 28th of July. We will need some help on the 27th. There are sign-up sheets in the back. There are still empty spots uh, for people to sign up and volunteer for a booth. Again, if you're volunteering for a game booth, uh, you don't really need to know anything except just show up on the day of and you'll discover the game booth is there and the instructions are simple. And uh, you'll have this Home Depot apron that has candy in one part and uh, prize tickets in the other part. You take the game tickets, put it in the third section and uh, anyway, we're going to have a time. It's going to be absolutely wonderful and look forward to your help. We do have a supply needs and there's a list there, sign up list for supplies. We are going to need a lot of cupcakes for the cupcake walk. Uh, we're going to also need a lot of candy, a lot of penny candy, a lot of that. It's not penny candy anymore. Now it's dollar candy. It's dollar fifty candy. It was penny candy once upon a time. And, but we're going to need that small candy that they can kind of give out for prizes so that here's what that does. What that does is say uh, we discover somebody goes to the basketball throw and they can't, they can't get a single basket in. You have a choice. You either give them candy or you watch them cry a million tears right in front of you. What do I, what do I think you do? Okay, we, we have something that we have something to give someone who, who misses all the balloons on the dart throw or something like that. So it's going to be a wonderful time, and we're very, very much looking forward to that. Uh, just to our church family quarterly business meeting coming up in a couple weeks here, do want to let you know that. We will have posters and flyers available um, uh, by next Sunday. And by the way, once we do that, we are just going all over town with those. Uh, we will also advertise on Facebook. And anyway, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful time. So looking at that, Sharon would love to be here to um, promote this, but she is not here. She has been under the weather this week. Her and, her and Danelle, pray for them. But uh, she has a sign-up sheet for our annual church picnic, which will be held high noon, Saturday, August 3rd, at her location. That is a wonderful place to go. They supply all the burgers and hot dogs and buns and condiments. The church supplies all the beverages, and then you supply all the side dishes and dessert. And so there's a sign-up list for the side dishes and dessert there. Uh, that is a wonderful location. Here you are, you're, you're in sage rush, you're in tumbleweeds, and all of a sudden you drive into this amazing green oasis which is the Sacrosan Farm. And so anyway, if you could sign up for that, uh, that would be absolutely wonderful as well. Again, encourage you, uh, do what you can uh, to reach people for Christ. Again, we have stacks of these on the Klamath Street for Christ table, and they are red, white, and blue, and it's praying for America. And like I said, the receptivity of people taking these from you increased tenfold over the weekend and you know why. And so we certainly pray for our country, we pray for our president. Um, and, and listen, there's always knuckleheads out there who don't know how to respond to something like this. But 
I am hearing some very, very good things from people widespread. And they're saying, you know what? We have been, some of them are saying, hey guys, tone it down. No, don't create an atmosphere that's going to create violence. And uh, some very, very good things are being said nationwide right now from the majority of our leaders. And uh, you never know what it's going to take to, to kind of turn things. God is in charge, and we don't know how long this will last. You know, in, in 30 days, they may be at each other's throats again. We have no idea. But, but right now, something good's happening. And so pray to God that, uh, that, you know, the sobering and the seriousness and the patriotism and how much we care and love for our country, pray that that'll continue. I think it's important that we do. Brother Carl's going to lead us in a couple more songs here. We're having a committee meeting. Everything's good. All right. Let's turn to number uh, 149. 149, Because He Lives.
all please remain standing as we look in the Word of God. We're looking at Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Book of Mark chapter 10, uh, looking at verse 17. I'm going to just read the first verse here, and then we will continue ahead. And um, I'm going to check here. Uh, Paul, if you could migrate to the back here. Again, I know we're in a heat wave. Is there anybody in here and you're in need of water tonight? I just kind of want to look. Okay, hands are coming up. I see one, two, three. Um, looking on this side, four. Uh, so I'm looking at four right now. I saw three on this side, one on the front here. And uh, then, of course, what's going to happen is going to come in the door and all of a sudden, everybody's going to covet your water. And uh, then they go, well, I would like one too. And so uh, I would say this because we're into a long-term heat wave. Do what you can uh, to get enough water in you. Do what you can to get enough rest because this heat will take both uh, water and rest right out of you. And so anyway, we're looking. I need to create a conveyor belt into the coat room. And always, you know, it's like... We're kind of a hurry up and wait here. One person, at a time. One person at a time. There we go. Okay. And Paul is on the run right there. And wow. Uh, who gets the big one? Okay. Who is... Say what? Okay. Very, very good. Looking at that. And anyway, he is swinging around this way. And uh, uh, that's it. Okay, looking right there. Very, very good. Just trying to take care. Who else? Raise your hand. He didn't see. Okay, Emily right over here. She needs one. He'll swing around there. And uh, we're counting down. Emily and Nathan need one. So that's Emily. And are, you one, are you one shy, Nathan? Did you get one? You got it. Okay, very, very good. Okay, Mark chapter 10, looking at verse 17. Please look along with me. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running. And kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? That is a question. We will get an answer in just a little bit here. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray now that you would use this service for your glory. And that you would use your word that we would not simply look at it in an academic sense. But that we would look at it for what it is. And that is your living word spoken to us in the here and now. And help us to place your living word in our hearts that we may live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, last week we talked about the fact that we're in a two-part message. And the two-part message is entitled, The Three Warnings. Uh, last week, we discussed sin's eternal consequence, and just as we heard a very, very graphic description from Jesus Christ of what hell is like, Jesus gave some descriptions of what hell was like last week uh, for those who continue in sin and do not receive the gift of eternal life from Jesus Christ. It also had some very, very choice words to say against child abusers last week and you have a feeling it said it'd be better if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the heart of the sea and so we remember the warning of sin's eternal consequence we remember the warning of divorce and that was last week as well and understand that the devil really does not do anything. He lies. It's the only thing he created. He really undoes things. And he takes a look at every institution of God and he works to undo it. He looks at God's institution of the church and he works to undo it. He, he causes people that are born again believers to function more as siblings than as brothers and sisters. And you know, so Satan tries to undo things in his church in Christ church and then we also have that um, uh, the devil tries to undo government and and wow this is a object lesson weekend on the devil's attempt to undo government and in many ways it was coming but it's one thing to see for those of you who are um, you we call you old timers okay 
and you were around in 1981 during the attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan. And you were around in 1968 where um, the Robert F. Kennedy Jr., the independent candidate that's running his own father as Attorney General of the United States was assassinated. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Five years before that, our last president to be clearly assassinated, uh, Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated. Similar scenario, long-range sniper setup. And so, uh, so we see these things. We realize history repeats itself. And because the devil is not limited by the lifespan of a human being, he just keeps doing these things. Keeps working to undo government. And uh, he tries to undo marriage. He works very, very hard. I, I've never uh, ceased to be surprised by this. I will see a situation where two people are living in sin. You know, they're shacked up. Uh, they're what the Bible calls they're fornicating. Uh, they are not doing it God's way. They are not uh, um, committing to each other in matrimony. And they seem to be getting along okay. It's a weird deal. The moment they get married, they're at each other's throats. And you know why? Because that's God's institution and, God try, and the devil tries to undo everything that God tries to do. And so we have G Christ's warning of divorce. But tonight we have a warning against riches. And it's, uh, let, me, let me qualify this by saying something. It is not wrong to have riches. Not wrong to have that. That happens to some people. Some people, either their parents were rich and they inherit it, or uh, they accidentally become successful, or they accidentally invent something. Something happens, people wind up rich. It's not, um, it's, there's, the warning isn't against being rich, and it's not against having riches. It's really against riches having you. And we're dealing with this warning, and, and what we have here is we have a young rich man in other parts of the Gospels, in the Synoptic Gospels, it, it calls him a rich young ruler. So not only is he young, he's rich, he has some authority, uh, <clears throat> he has some reputation. Uh, very interesting, he's never identified in Scripture who he is. Uh, there is some conjecture, I'll get into that in a moment. But I want you to understand, here in the United States of America, we live in extremely materialistic society. You know, we complain if our, if our fast food burger is, doesn't come quite as fast. Um, you know, um, children cry over their Happy Meals. 90% of the country goes, what's a Happy Meal? They don't even know what it is. And um, we, you know, uh, we eat three meals of the day, sometimes better than we should, and it shows. And uh, so we have all these things that, that take place. We live in a very... And, this problem that is mentioned in Scripture, it tears at the fabric of true discipleship where Jesus is trying to get us to. So I want to talk about this final warning, and this final warning, of course, is uh, the warning about riches. And so let's look at the issue, what we're dealing with here. Uh, first of all, let's look at uh, the living problem that exists right here so and when he was gone forth into the way there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him good master what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life there is nothing wrong with the question it is a good question and the young man asked Christ a good question and a right question He's asking the most important question. The man says, I want to inherit eternal life. I want to go to heaven. I want to live forever. What do I need to do? And so, and he's not being facetious. He's not testing Jesus. This is a genuine inquiry from this young individual. And let me tell you something. These people are all around us 
They have the question. They don't know who to ask. They don't know where to go to get the answer. Uh, some of the people that show up in our church, they've been everywhere. You know, they've gone to the Catholic, they've gone to the LDS, they've gone to the Lighthouse Church, they've gone everywhere. They have bounced all over the place and they're trying to find an answer. This really happens. They're actually, genuinely, seriously looking. Now, by the time they've gone to those three or four locations, they're more confused than a termite in a yo-yo. And, uh, you know, and it's hard to get things straightened out after you hear kind of all that stuff. But they're looking. It's a good question. This man has a good question. And then Jesus actually asks him a question back. Remember, this is one of the teaching methods of Jesus Christ. They would ask Jesus a question. He would ask him back. So they would have to think. And Jesus, in this case, is asking the question back. And what he's trying to find out from the young man, do you know what you just said? Because he says this, and Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. He said, okay, you called me good. Why did you call me good? Only God is good. And it's kind of an inquiry to get this man to think, okay, I called him good master. Am I calling him God? And Jesus is kind of saying, do you know what you're saying? And Jesus is saying, are you calling me God? No. We never really get an answer in this situation whether the rich young ruler believed that Jesus was God at this point. Now, he may have at a later point. That's conjecture looking at the future. But it's a good question because Jesus is God. And he is good. And he is the good master. So these things are true. And so then he goes on, he says, we have a good question. We have the man actually, whether ignorantly or on purpose, gave Christ the proper identification. And so Jesus says, okay, well, you know these things. And Jesus, in saying these things, is kind of checking to see where the man is. What's he about? And it's, do you have a moral behavior or a moral bent? Do you have a direction? Do you have a right? Or do you have a biblical? Do you have a scriptural sense of right and wrong? And so Jesus says this, Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And so Jesus is saying, okay, you know these commandments. And he answered, and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. And so Jesus, in saying, you know the commandments, is giving him a list, and the man is saying, yes, I do know those commandments. Yes, I do follow those commandments. Yes, I do want to do righteously. I want to live righteously. I want to be righteous. Yes, I really do. And so then Jesus gives a loving appeal. It says, Jesus beholding him. And you kind of go, that's kind of a strange statement. Let's think that through. Well, obviously Jesus was having a conversation and looking at him. But have you ever had somebody really look at you? It's not just they're having a conversation, but they're really kind of looking at you. Not they're staring you down, but they're, they're evaluating. And so Jesus stopped and he just, he looked. And he evaluated. And it said when Jesus did, he loved him. You know, it's interesting. They say eyes are the windows to the soul. Can, can you tell when somebody loves another person? Can you tell in their activity? Can you tell in their comportment? Um, can you tell when they're just kind of gaga or nuts over each other? Can you, can you actually see that? 
But can you imagine what it'd be like if Jesus stopped and looked at you and beheld you and you could see the love in his eyes? What an amazing thing that is. And it says Jesus beholding him loved him. Sometimes we have to stop and look at not just what Jesus said, what he did. And so that affected everything about the response that Jesus gave. He didn't give it sternly. He gave it gently. He gave it lovingly. And he said this, one thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. I picture it's that way. I picture it was an encouraging thing. Come on, come with me. So we have Christ's loving pill. He loves us, he loves you. But he also knows what stands in the way because he's God. And so the man, he said, get rid of everything that's of earthly value and convert to eternity's value and follow me. And so we have Christ's loving appeal, but then we have the grievous departure. And if you look here, it said, and he was sad at that saying. The Christ who loved him gave him the answer to eternal life, but his response was sadness. Now, let me stop. That's not a bad thing, and I'll explain in a moment. But it was a grievous department. He went away grieved, for he had great possessions. It's a grievous departure. And why? And this is the answer. The great possessions had him. That was the grief. And that was the sadness. Now, it's not bad that he was grieved. It would be worse if he went away angry. But he didn't go away angry. He didn't go away, well, I'm not going to let this person tell me what I'm supposed to do. I'm not going to let this person tell me I need to give up all my stuff. He didn't go away angry. He went away sad. He went away troubled. He went away grieved. That's a good thing. Because sorrow can turn us to God. We see God more clearly through our tears than about anything else. It's really true. We don't draw close to God when everything's going great. Let's face it. We draw close to God when things are really, really rough. This man, this set up a struggle in this man's life. Now, tradition guesses possibly. There's no way to know for sure. When you get to heaven, we'll be able to put a name to this guy. But many think this man eventually came to Christ. And many think this was Joseph of Arimathea. Many think this was the rich man who gave away the rich man's tomb for Jesus to actually lay in after he died on the cross. So we have this reality. So first we have, we have we're dealing with the warning of riches. We have this living problem, this problem that exists, and that is trying to get to where we should get, having an obstacle in the way. In this particular case, in this particular message, it's riches that's in the way, and it's setting up a tug-of-war. And the tug-of-war is this. Are we going to have faith in riches? Or are we going to have faith in God? That is the tug-of-war. Are you going to trust your checkbook? Are you going to trust your credit card? Are you going to trust your loan officer? Or are you going to trust Almighty God? What are you going to trust? This is the tug-of-war that exists in our society. And the way you know it, I'll ask you a question. Do you worry about your bills? Man, nobody wants to answer that question. Do you worry about your bills? Have you ever thought that, why don't you let God worry about your bills? And just let the Lord provide for you. You realize we get, you know, we get so stressed out. We go, I'm not going to be able to pay that. Well, I notice you're still here. I'm not going to be able to eat. Well, I notice you're still fed. 
It's amazing how many calories we burn up worrying about our stuff, worrying about our bank accounts, worrying about too much month at the end of money, worrying about the bill we forgot about that suddenly showed up and said, hello, I'm still here. We worry about that. It's the tug of war, the faith and riches and not God. And so, and Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, how hardly they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. And so Jesus proclaims that riches is a main obstacle to eternity. That's very disconcerting. Some of you have been involved in bus ministries and shuttle ministries in different locations. Anyone here say, I was involved in a bus ministry, okay? Or I was a bus kid, okay? Okay, did they pick you up at the mansion? No, you know why? The buses don't go visit the mansions because nobody there wants to come to church. They've got their stuff. It's the people in the apartments can hardly make rent. It's the people that are poor. It's the people that are struggling. It's the people that have broken homes. They're the ones that want to go to church. How hardly they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God, a main obstacle. And so... You have the two astonishments of the disciples, okay? You have the disciples here go to two levels. They have more surprised to out of their minds shocked. Because if you look here, it says this, and the disciples were astonished at his words. It's like the disciples, you know, Jesus said it, and they all just went, what? What does he mean? How can this be? And so they're surprised, and so guess what Jesus does? He repeats himself. And Jesus answereth again and saith unto him, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And at that point, they were looking for their heart medication. They were astonished beyond measure saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Because they had had wrong teachings, and we talked about this morning. It was a success gospel teaching. And here is what the teaching of the day was. Riches equal righteousness. That was the teaching of the day. So if you were rich, that meant that God was smiling on your life, and that meant you were a righteous person. And so they had a totally wrong doctrine, okay? You know, by that doctrine, you know, by that doctrine, Bill Gates should be the most spiritual man on planet Earth, okay? Now we know different. But this, is the, this was the mindset of that day. It was kind of the TBN mindset. You know, it's kind of the, kind of the I'm sorry to say, it's kind of the Benny Hinn mindset, you know? Listen, that, Send in all your money so we can put more gold in our bathroom stalls and I can get a better hairstyle, you know, that type of thing. And so you have all those things that were going on and the reality is they thought riches equaled righteousness. And they thought, we're all going to hell. That's exactly what they thought. The disciples said, man alive, we're following Jesus and we're poorer than church mice. We're all doomed at this point. Until Jesus said this. He said, Jesus looking upon them, saith, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. And when Jesus said that, I really, this is just, I, I don't know this, my heart of hearts, I'm reading pride too much into this. I think Jesus was thinking about the rich man that just went away sad and thought, you know what? This is a hard case. And I'm thinking that Jesus took a quick look at his father and says, well, we got this, don't we? You know, said, yeah, it's hard. But with God, all things are possible. God gives everybody a chance. And the hope was given. God can do it. 
God can take that. God can take a person to the end of themselves where they realize, you know what, the things, as somebody has, some of you may have this in, the, in your houses. You may have it stenciled on your walls or a little reader board. It says, the most important things in life aren't things. You may actually have that. So, leave it to Peter. Those wheels are always turning in that guy. I'll tell you what, his brain is going so quick, it is smoking. Okay? And so, leave it to Peter. And he begins to speak. You can count on Peter to begin to speak. It's happening here. And here's what happened. And Peter began to say, and the wheels are turning. Because Jesus said, he's thinking back. Okay, he said to the rich man, get rid of all your riches. And you will have treasure in heaven and follow me. And the wheels are turning in Peter's mind. Okay. Except Peter thinks out loud. And Peter begins to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and follow thee. And he's inhaling to make another statement. Said Peter began to say. Peter didn't get to finish his statement. Okay? It's one of the few times Jesus interrupted a statement. But you have here. But Peter's wheel was turning. He was connecting all the dots. Says, well, you told that man to leave everything and follow you. And guess what? We've done that. So, so Peter's thinking through this. And so his mind was, he said, you will have treasure in heaven. Peter's thinking, I wonder what the treasure in heaven is. And Peter. And you know, one of the other scriptures talks about this. And it says that Peter actually got blurted out of his mouth. What have we there for? So Peter is thinking this way. And so here is what it is. There is a cost. Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife. I'll explain that in a moment. Or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. So here is the cost of discipleship. The cost of discipleship is you might leave home. The cost of discipleship is you might leave your family behind. And what I mean, leave your clan behind. Your, you know, your three to seven, 27 generations of family. Hey, we've all lived in the same place, but I'm going to go follow Jesus. You may leave your family behind. That's what Jesus is talking about. By the way, it really applied to their day because you know what? People didn't move in Bible times. They just stuck around and one generation went into another, went into another, went into another. That's the way it was there. Okay. So the cost is leaving home or leaving family or leaving wife and children. Some of you go, is God saying he's supposed to leave his wife and children? That's not what that means. Okay. Um, any military men? Military men in here? Where's my military men? Okay? Okay. Uh, some of you were deployed. Okay? Some deployments, they don't let you take your wife and kids with you. You know? During the war on terror, I'm sorry, when those folks were deployed to Afghanistan or Iraq, uh, they weren't allowed to take their wifey with them or their kids with them to dwell in tents and, and uh, ha have IEDs blown up around them or anything like that. And by the way, that's the way it is with the gospel. What it was is the idea of missions trips. You know, many of you realize, okay, you've got your Pauls, you've got your John Mark. Do you realize you've got Peter going around all over the place with Jesus? He's not home. And contrary to popular demand, the guy was married. Because you know what? It would really be a real mess. Think about this because the, the Catholic Church says Peter was not married. I thought, how terrible is that? Number one, you're not married. And number two, you have a mother-in-law. Because the Bible says he has a mother-in-law. So you're not married with a mother-in-law? Really? 
So what did Peter do? Peter went with the disciples. He went with Jesus. Peter was away from home without his wife and kids all the time. That's what it means. Cost of discipleship. The ministry trips. Takes you away from the house. Takes you away from home. And then it is this also where it says or lands. You do. You leave your land. You leave your country. You go to the mission field. And so there is a cost. And those are the costs. And then it says, what's the reason? Why do you do it? Well, you do it for my sake. You do it for, to follow or to benefit Christ. So that's why you're going. That's why you're leaving things. It's to benefit the Savior. It's to benefit Jesus Christ. And it says, for my sake and the Gospels. So it's to spread the Gospel of Jesus Christ too. And so right here you have the eternal benefit. You have the cost. And you have the reason. And then you have the reward. And it says, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time. Houses, plural. And I'm not saying, it's not houses like you think houses. Wow, I'm now a land baron. I own an apartment community, blah, 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 blah. It's not that. No, it's you have shelter and you have places to stay. And it's kind of cool because you wind up with places to stay all over the place. And, yeah, brethren and sisters and mothers and children. Notice it doesn't say you have wives. I'm sure glad it didn't say that. You know, now the Bible is not promoting a wife in every port. That's not what's going on here in Scripture. But what it's saying is, understand that when Jesus died, he died to make us a family, to make us the family of God. And so everywhere you go in the ministry, you meet family. You know, I've been in the ministry long enough. I keep running into people who have run into people who have run into people. And, and we know these people in common and that people in common. And, you know, I used to say when I was younger in the ministry, small world, but somebody cured me of that. He said, no, it's not a small world. It's a big family. And when it comes to the Christian life and you're living for Christ, it's a big family. And then there's this lands Lands plural, and what this idea is, it's the blessing of exotic locations. You wind up going and seeing new places. And you know, some of us, of you, you have had the fun with this of us. We've had capital connection. We went to Washington, D.C. Caleb, you went to the country of Myanmar. So did Mrs. Watkins. No, recently I went to Mexico. You wind up going different places. But it's part of that discipleship and that surrender with Jesus Christ. And then it says this, so you're having all these things that sound wonderful, and then it says, with persecutions. Uh, that's a little less the wonderful part. It means there's going to be problems, there's going to be trials, there's going to be struggles. Some will lose their lives. But then it says this, and in the world to come, eternal life. Remember, what did the man ask at the beginning? Ma good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, it all comes down to what you're going to follow. Are you going to follow your funds or are you going to follow me? You know, what are you going to make the center of your life? And you know, are you, what are you willing to give up to follow me? And so we're dealing here very much with the cost of discipleship. But Jesus says, listen, you're going to give up a lot, but God's going to give you a lot. And you're going to spend eternity in heaven. And it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful thing. But I want you to understand something. Heaven is an entirely different value system than earth. But many that are first shall be last. And many and the last first. So what, what does this mean here? It means Earthly reputation and recognition holds no value in heaven. Doesn't mean anything of what heaven is about. God will decide in heaven who he is or who he isn't going to exalt. Okay? That's why one person one time told me a long time ago, says, you know what? You know, all of the church janitors are getting promoted in heaven is what they said 
The people that are serving God and nobody even knows they are. Those are the ones that are going to get promoted. You know, those who got recognition because they wanted to, it's all they get. You know, I notice God doesn't repeat himself. That's why it says in Scripture, verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So you kind of have a choice, okay? If you want the recognition of people here, God says, okay, done. And then you get to heaven. Do I get that again? No. That's how it works. But if you didn't get it here, you may get it there. So that's what it is. God will decide who he exalts. Next week, the servant of all is headed to Jerusalem. And there's many, many things that happen on that journey. And we will deal with that next week. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, please use your word and help us. So many different people here tonight, some of us, Lord, we may not have that long before we see you if you tarry. If you return, we'd be great with that. But if you tarry, Lord, there's some of us, we have just a bit of our, little bit of our lives left. Others have a lot of their lives left. And Lord, there's, uh, there's so many things that we can do in our pursuits, what we can pursue with our lives. And some of those things have eternal value and some of those things we know have temporal value, but no eternal value. I pray, Lord, help us to be willing to leave all and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's stand together. The song is number 157. 157. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. 157. Let's stand as we sing. There's a need on your heart, something that you want to talk to God about. You can do that at this time. Amen.